Now to the second half of my interview with Attorney General William Barr. We begin this evening from the courtyard of the Department of Justice by continuing the conversation about the organized elements of some of the rioting and looting. Barr singled out Antifa yesterday, but also said authorities are seeing a, quote, witch's brew of extremist groups. We have, you know, conservative, uh, extreme right groups trying to look like uh, extreme left groups. We have extreme left groups masquerading as extreme right groups. We have players on both sides trying to uh, spin up violence. So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated situation. But you expect that there'll be more arrest at the organizing part of it? Yes. Soon? I, I can't put a time limit on these investigations, but I think uh, you know, we are very much focused on getting on top of these groups turning the page here to the Durham report mm -hmm. and wondering when that is going to come out. You're now a few months away from an election and there's some expectation that there's going to be at least some bombshells in there about the investigation of the investigation into Trump collusion. Well, I, you know, I can't address expectations. I can say that uh, even with the disruption of COVID and the fact that our court system has essentially been shut down for a few months. The Durham team has been working very aggressively to move forward. And as I've also said, this isn't being driven by uh, producing a report. We are trying to uh, get to a point where we can hold accountable uh, anyone who crossed the line and committed a criminal violation. So that's, I think, would, you know, would be the, the, uh, the initial uh, stage uh, of, of, a, of a resolution of, of Durham's investigation. But I also think that there will be public disclosure in some form of report at but the appropriate time. From what you've seen, crimes have been committed? Well, I, I, I can't say, you know. Well, can you paint a picture of what it looks like as far as broad nature of it? Uh, well, I think, you, you know, I, I think before the election, I think we're concerned about the uh, motive force behind the very aggressive investigation that was launched into the Trump campaign without, you know, with a very thin, slender read as a, as a basis for it. It seemed that the bureau was sort of spring-loaded at the end of July to drive in there uh, and investigate a campaign, and they, they really wasn't much there to do that on, and that became more and more evident as they went by, but they seemed to have ignored all the exculpatory evidence that was building up and continued pell-mell to push it forward. So that's one area of concern. The other area of concern is that after the election, uh, even though uh, they were closing down some of it, as we've seen in the Flynn case, and say there's nothing here, uh, for some reason they went right back at it even at a time uh, where the evidentiary uh, support or, or claim support, like the dossier, uh, was falling apart. And it's, it's very hard to understand why they continued to push uh, and even make public uh, in, in testimony that they had an investigation going when it was becoming painfully obvious, or should have been obvious to anyone, uh, that there was nothing there. You always get uh, lumped in with being political, and you've pushed back against that, the characterization that you're the president's attorney. But as you get closer to an election, doesn't releasing this report and making it more at risk for falling into that political bucket? I'm sure there are people who, who might say that. I've, I've publicly made clear that this does not uh, involve uh, looking at President Obama or, uh, or Vice President Biden. I think the people that we're looking at are not uh, uh, at that level, and I think... Uh, what names we would be familiar with? Some of them. Uh, but, uh, you know, here's the thing. For the first time in American history, police organizations and the uh, national security organizations were used to spy on a campaign and there was no basis for it. And the media largely drove that. And all kinds of sensational claims were being made about the president that could have affected the election. And then later on in his administration, there were actions taken that really appear to be efforts to sabotage uh, his campaign. And that has to be looked at. And if people want to say that I'm political because I am looking at those potential abuses of power, so be it. But that's the job of the attorney general. If you had to characterize the Durham report as you know it now, um, is it going to be eye-opening for Americans, or is this going to be kind of a blip on the on the road to? I am, you know, I'm very troubled by 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 what has been called to my attention so far, but I'm not going to uh, characterize it beyond that. 
Can you tell us anything about the investigation into unmasking? You know, unmasking is not by itself illegal, uh, but uh, the patterns of unmasking uh, can tell us something uh, about people's motivations at any given point of time. Uh, so we're trying to take a look at the whole waterfront on unmasking, what was done especially uh, in 2016. And is there criminal implications there? As I say, it's not, it's not against the law to, to unmask anyone. But, I mean, for example, let's say, suppose uh, for a period in the spring uh, there was a lot of heavy unmasking done on people involved with the Trump campaign. That would be very relevant as to what people were thinking at that time and what their motivations were. You mentioned the Flynn case. You're in the process of trying to dismiss that charge, the, the charges, yet the judge, Judge Sullivan, continues on and has now a shadow prosecutor in making a case that it should continue. The argument is that uh, it's always been understood that decisions, whether to pursue an individual through the prosecution process or holding them criminally accountable, is vested in the executive branch and uh, not the courts. Uh, and he is essentially, in our view, trying to set himself up as an alternative prosecutor. And so have you seen anything like this before? I'm not aware of anything like this before, and I think that's why uh, this is not being argued at the appellate stage in the District of Columbia. I know you can't get into specifics, but the DOJ Inspector General identified this top FBI lawyer who fabricated evidence in order to justify this warrant against Carter Page to spy on him. We know that's a crime, yet there haven't been any charges yet. Uh, is that person still working at the FBI? No. And are there charges? Pending? Well, you know, I, we can't discuss, you know, future charges, but I have to say that I do find it a little irritating, you know, the propensity in the American public on all sides of the political spectrum when they see something they think could be a criminal violation and say, why hasn't this person been indicted yet? Why hasn't this person been indicted? Why? And, you know, there's the old saying that, that the wheels of justice uh, grind slow, and they do grind slow because we have due process and we follow the process. But people should not draw from the fact that no action has been taken that taken yet, uh, that that means that uh, people are, people are going to get away with wrongdoing. The president is counting on you and your department to crack down on social media platforms for what he calls censorship, including his own tweets. You said the law allows these companies to operate um, and it's been stretched beyond its original intent. So you think these firms are somehow censoring the president and his supporters? Well, I think there are, are clearly uh, these these entities are now engaged in censorship, and they originally held themselves out as open forum where people, could, third parties, could come and express their views, and they built up a tremendous uh, network of eyeballs. Uh, they with a lot of market power uh, based on that present presentation and now they are acting much more like publishers because they're censoring particular viewpoints and putting their own content in there uh, to uh, to uh, diminish the impact of various uh, people's views so is there some action that you're taking well we are looking uh, as many others are at uh, changing uh, section 230 which is a, a rule that provides some protection for these companies which would require Congress which would require Congress yes prisoner swaps with Iran have required the Justice Department to drop charges or agree to time served for defendants in federal courts is this a good policy when Iran arrests people for just being American well it's a policy that you know has to be uh, handled with care uh, that we don't invite you know, seizing of more Americans. Uh, but in the individual cases where we've done this, we felt the benefit outweighed the risk. So it was worth it? Yes. More to come on that? I can't say. What is it like working with President Trump in the middle of these crises? It's two in a row now, and you've been meeting with him a lot. It's uh, good because I think the president's a very uh, decisive person, and he's interested in hearing all the views. There's a lot of robust discussion. Uh, and he makes a decision, and uh, I think he's been a good leader. If the president is reelected, would you serve in a second term? I'm not going to get into that. You're not? No. But if he asked you, would you? That would be presumptuous of me to discuss that. Our thanks to the attorney general and his staff.